We're on the edge of Wild Park Local Nature Reserve Brighton, which is about 15 to 20 minutes walk from our home. And for five years, I used to do a UK butterfly monitoring skiing transit here, which is why I know that occasionally you can come across a grizzle skipper. Now, the grizzle skipper has diminished its distribution in the UK by 50%, which is why it's on the Biodiversity Action Plan for the UK. And as a consequence, it's protected by the NERC Act under Section 41 in England and Section 42 in Wales. So this begs the question, how did it get to this state? And as a consequence, what can we do to help it recover? What about the children? Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, this film is uh, dedicated to Jude and Aletha Holton. They're my greatest fans. <laughs> To get to know the grizzled skipper a little better, my first port of call was to spend some time with an expert. Tom! Hi Dan, good to see you. Good to see you too Tom. Yeah. Wow, it's a lovely day isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely brilliant, what a fantastic day, fantastic place and uh, wonderful view as well. Well I've never been here before but I know for you this is pretty special isn't it? It is a special place actually, it's one of the four main study sites where I did my PhD on the grizzled skipper. And I haven't been back since, so it's just... Uh, How long is that, Tom? Too long ago. <laughs> it's probably 1996 was the last time I was here, oh, so right. over 20 years. Yeah. Now, uh, you mentioned your PhD, and of course that's why we're here. Your PhD is renowned as a classic example of like an excellent study on the British butterfly. It's nice of you to say that, Dan. Well, yeah. I, I had a look at it, and I, I have to agree, it looks astonishing. It's really good. Yeah, I was... Uh, pretty good field ecologist at the time and and it was a great opportunity to uh, study an insect and just get out in the field get the sleeves rolled up and really understand the sort of ecology of the butterfly so spent many happy hours over sort of three or four years dawn till dusk out studying the butterfly well i'm just champing at the bit to see this insect me too shall yeah. we go and have a look yeah absolutely go. let's go Okay, Tom, so what can you tell me about the, um, the history of this insect? It's been known for a long time. I think it was one of the first uh, British butterflies to be uh, named. And uh, probably because it was quite widely distributed uh, in England and, wa and Wales. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, though, over, over the last century, the 20th century, it seemed to undergo a, a marked decline in, in distribution. Do we have any abundance. idea what that's about? I think the, uh, the decline in coppicing, uh, loss of semi-natural habitats, uh, you know, ploughing up of chalk grassland, and just general int intensification of grassland habitats has uh, caused its demise. Although on the positive side, the creation of brownfield ha habitats has, has benefited the butterfly. Yeah, actually, it's quite an odd butterfly when you think about it, because it it's a specialist that seems to have a range of habitats. That's right, yeah. It, it does occur in, in, in sort of coastal dunes, brownfield, woodlands, grasslands. But when you look close up, the, the habitat structure on a fine scale is pretty much the same at every site. And that's really what it's about, looking at it from the butterfly's point of view. Absolutely. So Tom, I mean, when I was setting up, you saw a couple of grizzles, but I've not seen any yet. It's surprising really, considering how many eggs we've seen scattered through the site, that we haven't uh, seen a, 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 you know, any adults together, but we're, we're back in the spot where I saw them earlier today, so let's keep our fingers Oh, crossed. Tom, look, look there. Oh, wow, yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, uh, it's obvious why it's called the Marsh Artillery in the old days, isn't it? Because it's got that checkerboard look. Yeah. But and also, it amazes me that a beautiful fringe of the black and white. It's go gorgeous patterning, isn't it? Very intricate, yeah, just lots of... Uh, white spots and a really nice uh, sort of brown sheen to them as well at this stage in the season. Tell me, have you ever seen that aberration, the one which has got, what's it called, the one which has got the Is nice... Is it Abtaras, I think? That's right, yeah, yeah. No, I haven't actually, no. So, 
Taurus was never really a part of the focus of this video, in part because Tom Brereton had said in the four years he did his PhD, he never once saw it in West Sussex. And yet, I was talking to my really good friend here, Richard Roebuck, and you have a different tale to tell me from an undisclosed location in East Sussex. Yeah, I, uh, I saw a posting of a Taurus and I'd never seen one in, in West Sussex at all. So I uh, went out of my way, went and had a look and found absolutely nothing. Anyway, I, I continued thinking about that and I came back to the same spot a year later uh, and it was sort of early morning and within 10 minutes I found a Taurus and it was just an amazing sight to see. But not only that, I found another 11 Taurus individuals all in the same area. That's incredible. But no normal ones. None at all. No, absolutely no normal pattern ones. Now that's absolutely astonishing because of course we've come here today and I've come and found exactly the same thing. You know, we found seven Taurus here yeah. and one normal. And if you read Neil Hume's account in his book, The Butterflies of Sussex, he says of course that this is a recessive gene that you'd expect to express itself at 25% level. And we're seeing way above that. I mean, what do you think is going on? Yeah, it's, it's, it's in a very localised area and it's surrounded by trees. And then this sort of field area, and then it's an industrial area on the other side. So I think they're a very localised population, so perhaps the gene, the recessive gene, is expressing itself more. Oh, because it's a restrictive gene pool? Yeah. That makes so much sense. And now you say that, it makes me realise that if you read uh, Colin uh, Pratt's book, and he talks about there being absolutely no Taurus records in West Sussex, but loads in East Sussex, does that mean that... Does that mean that these fragmented habitats for the grizzle skipper in East Sussex and not in the West? Yeah, well, could well be. Uh, the landscape is quite different, I don't know. Yeah. Now, while we're on that uh, subject of a mystery, look at this here. This is absolutely incredible. This yes. here is a video. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's incredible, isn't it? On the one side, you've got the, uh, the Taurus uh, uh, expression, yes. and on the left-hand side, it's a normal butterfly. Yeah. So this was sent to me by a guy called John Chapel down in Cornwall, and uh, I, I'm, I'm, I absolutely sure that this is a male so it's not a gynandromorph yes yeah, yeah. and so okay. my view is that we're looking at something which has a, a bilateral asymmetry suggesting therefore that this Taurus gene is not sex linked yeah maybe so yeah it's all, it's all a bit of a mystery really isn't it it is but it just goes to show with butterflies there's always so there's all, much more to learn you did right there's always something to see every year is different Richard Roebuck thank you very much pleasure So Tom, what makes good grizzle skipper habitat? Well, we're walking through some, some perfect habitat here, Dan. A good grizzle skipper habitat would have a, a number of features that meet the resource requirements of males, females, the adults, but also all the immature stages. And this, this habitat's got the lots. So you've got a, a nice scrub edge there, mm -hmm. a warm sheltered spot where the males will uh, try to uh, form a territory to meet uh, passing females. You've mm -hmm. got uh, a sward that has scrub in it, uh, long grass, short grass, so variable microclimates, mm -hmm. uh, lots of bare ground, and there's lots of the caterpillars' food plants spread through it. So plants like agrimony, wild strawberry, creeping sankfowl, but also coarser plants like bramble as well. Uh, there's lots of nectar sources that, that the butterfly uses here as well. Things like buttercup, mm -hmm. Jamanda speedwell, daisies. So not, not very rare plants, but uh, ones that are very important for the butterfly. So Tom, what can you tell me about um, the natural enemies? I mean, uh, parasitoids is particularly interesting, but anything else? Yeah, the, the, the adults do have natural enemies. Uh, spiders uh, cause quite a bit of predation. Uh, both the ones that have webs in the air and those on the ground as well. Mm. The, the female egg laying females can get caught up in webs I on see. the ground, and then and then both both sexes can fly into webs and and uh, get eaten by spiders. Uh, the w one of the other insect uh, uh, predators is the robber fly as well. Uh, mm. They they can. Uh, well, they attack a range of and kill a range of butterflies from something as big as a marble white to a, a grizzle skipper. Right. So they the, 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 the sort of patrolling male butterflies that congregate on the edge of scrub are particularly vulnerable to predation by uh, robber flies. In terms of parasitoids, that is a big problem for many butterflies. Uh, 
can have huge population effects, things like uh, tortoise shells and uh, red admirals and things. But in my PhD, I didn't find a great deal of evidence for, for, for parasitoids causing uh, problems. I, for example, I raised uh, about 50 caterpillars through to maturity over a uh, over a two-year period, right. and none of them had pa were parasitized. Oh, were you surprised? I was. Yeah, you'd expect one or two, even uh, to show a sort of low-level effect. But, yeah. but they're all healthy. I never found any dead uh, caterpillars either with that had been uh, parasitized. See. I think I found the perfect uh, habitat here, Dan, for the egg-laying females. This is uh, classic conditions. So we've got a nice big patch of uh, loose soil, mm -hmm. which creates a very hot uh, microclimate. If you put your hand on that, you can feel the heat there. It's remarkable, uh, isn't it? Yeah, it's nice and warm. Po poke your finger in there and you can feel Ooh, how cool that is. Big difference. It can be, yeah, it can be sort of 10, 15 degrees uh, hotter here. And that's really important for butterflies like the grizzle skipper, which are on the edge of their northern range margin in, in uh, the UK they really need the hottest microclimates to complete their development successfully so that sort of reflected heat off the bare ground means the eggs will will uh, hatch more quickly so what tends to happen you've got as i say this big patch of bare ground a female will be uh, on an egg laying flight and then it appears to be a sort of search image the, the bare ground they'll drop out of the sky mm -hmm. walk over plants until they find one in the uh, rose family in this case it's a nice big agrimony plant with these uh, pairs of leaflets and a terminal leaflet another agrimony yeah yeah once they find the agrimony they will uh, curl the abdomen underneath and lay an egg on the underside that egg will take about a week to develop and the larvae will uh, walk onto the upper side and form a a little area of silk above it as a shelter and it will feed by grazing at the surface of the leaf so mm. if you look at this leaf mm. here you can see the characteristic feeding damage yeah. and a bit of residual silk there from the very first uh, efforts to eat of the caterpillar yeah. once it's fed on there for a while it will as it's grown in size and become more sort of powerful and bigger it's then able to uh, sew a leaf together and form a, a better shelter. So we can see a bit further down the, le the leaf, this is the next place the caterpillars move to. It's a tent uh, with the, uh, the uh, leaves sewn together by the caterpillar's own silk. So it will, it will graze uh, at the edge of the leaf here, pop its head out and eject some frass out the other end and gradually eat itself out of a house and home. Fat bramble can be very important in the for the later stage larvae. Because, I see. Yeah, because uh, as they grow uh, bigger and get a bigger appetite, basically, they, they need to feed quickly and, and uh, the bigger, rougher uh, bramble leaves are, are very attractive because they're the biggest sort of leaves that are available to them. Well, it begs the question though, Tom, if, if bramble is a food plant, why do we see this butterfly everywhere? I think the, the problem is, is that uh, it needs it, the earliest stages, uh, the, the larvae tiny, just like a millimetre and a half long, and yeah. they're not capable of, of eating uh, coarse bramble leaves. If you were to look under a microscope at a bramble leaf, you can see how thick and hairy it is. Yeah. And uh, a little caterpillar, early stage, just can't physically eat it. But, I see. but the big final instars are capable of chewing through them, so they, they, be, they become the ideal food source later on. So it's late May now. Um, when would you expect, first of all, to see the first eggs? Yeah, so we're coming up to the peak period. It's traditionally late May and early June is the peak for adult abundance, but the first ones will have been out in April. And uh, yeah, so, so any time from the first week in April, the adults can be on the wing. <laughs> eggs tend to hatch after a week or so, yeah. and they'll live as a caterpillar for about three months, and yeah, then go into pupation in the autumn. When I did my PhD, the, the pu pupation was around the time of the first frost in September, but uh, uh, we don't get those anymore, so oh. I'm not sure what the, que what the cues are for them to go into pupation. I see. Now, Tom, in the wild, have you ever seen the animal pupate? I have, but uh, I've cheated partially. <laughs> it was actually rearing the caterpillars till 
until the point where they become sluggish yeah. and and uh, you know they want to pupate then I release those into the wild and within a few hours I could see where they were pupating uh, but but at the end of the day they didn't seem to be that selective they would they would uh, choose a range of heights and vegetation structures to pupate in generally well concealed in fairly dense vegetation but but not as fussy or selective as the egg laying females or the caterpillars uh, yeah so so that was the end of that really i think more more research needs to be done i think right. on the on the sort of requirements of the pupil stages i see have you has, has anyone to your knowledge documented a, a wild found pupa I think I think they have been found, but so there's just not a great deal of evidence uh, on that area, just because they are so well concealed. I see. Right. So there are so many caterpillars here at the moment. Yeah. And yeah, of course, we don't see tons and tons and tons of butterflies. So what are the key factors in in this butterfly's life cycle? What really gets you? Any idea? Uh, yeah, it's a very good question. I d it's difficult to. I wasn't able to build sort of life tables that, that can give you that information. They're, they're pretty poor at finding the food plants. Mm. Uh, they, they always move on to uh, different plants uh, over the course of life, feed on perhaps 12, 15, 20 different individual plants. Once they leave one, they're absolutely hopeless at right. <laughs> finding others. I've seen them walk, uh, you know, sort of crawl or walk, whatever you call it, past uh, plants within one or two centimetres and completely miss them. So that begs the question then. So, it, 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 so if, if food plants are at low density, they might sort of just simply not find... Yeah, so it begs get, the question, does the female go for high density areas when she's laying? Is she, is she in any way selective? They are very selective, but, but the, the, it's really driven by the uh, microclimate. What other studies did you do in your PhD? Yeah, the PhD consisted of uh, following the adults and working out what the habitat requirements was uh, and the larvae as well, so that was a big part of it. But the other main aspect was the uh, population study, which involved catching them in the net and uh, market, giving them a, a unique mark with a, a ink from an overhead projector pen. Right. So was this like different colours for the units and tens and that sort yeah, of stuff? Yeah, th there is like a standard way, but I came up with my own system using uh, different coloured pens and uh, marks for different uh, units uh, on uh, the front of the wing. And you, that, with that system, with three different pens, four different places, you could mark up to 10,000, wow. which I, I didn't get near that. But, no, but that's but remarkable. I did, yeah, I did uh, catch... Uh, I think 1,600 individuals, Ooh. and recapture rate was was quite high, about 40%. So that that proved really that, well, a few things. One that the populations were generally quite small, because mm. uh, we had a project of butterfly conservation volunteers to sort of show that about 90% of the populations are there'd be less than 50 individuals yeah. on the peak day, which is quite small. But, but a big site, there could be 600 on a peak day and then up to 2,000 over the season. Goodness. So that would be a big population. Uh, so that's one interesting thing you get from mark recapture uh, by catching them. The other thing is uh, that high recapture rate that I mentioned, that, that shows that uh, the vast majority of individuals that that uh, emerge on a site they'll spend all their life there mm. and so the conservation really does depend on getting the management right at that site because they're largely sedentary yeah. you get some dispersal to nearby sites and some longer range movements as well but the, as i say the vast majority are small scale but it is amazing at what you can learn from uh, marking individuals you can work out what their sex ratio is yeah. how long they live uh, and uh, an astonishingly powerful technique then. yeah absolutely yeah it, I mean it showed that uh, the majority uh, live about seven to ten days but can live over a month some of them really? yeah the longest that must have been very yeah, unexpected yeah yeah so the longest was 29 days which is for, for a little insect is, yeah. is amazing as an adult you marked them, were you able to use that information to work out 
where they where they where you mark them from and where they where they where they recaptured. Yeah. Did you figure out how far they flew? Absolutely. The, the main study site was as Chanctonbury Ring in West Sussex, and that was a brilliant place to study because it was had both the north face and and south face in slopes with with colonies of grizzle skipper scattered yeah. in both. And uh, each time I caught one, I noted exactly where it was with a GPS. And uh, can I ask you, what did you use for that? Did one of these handheld handheld devices? GPS? Yeah, Fantastic. yeah, yeah, that's that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, but it just makes you know the hunger to catch every one because, uh, as you know, grizzle skipper, it doesn't generally occur in high numbers. Mm. So you you know uh, the next one you see, it could be that fascinating one that's moved a long way or mm. could be the longest lived one so you're just really hungry to catch every single one. I can imagine that as well because it's such a simple technique and yet you gain so very much yeah, from exactly. it on so many levels. Yeah I mean you could find interesting things like the north facing slope the butterflies it, uh, peaked and emerged about a week later even yeah. though they were only separated by about uh, 50 meters of uh, farmland habitat. It also showed that uh, woodland and agricultural uh, farmland cereal fields and, and, and intensive pasture they really do restrict movement yeah even if the open habitats uh, very few butterflies would cross those so at Chanctonbury the, the the different areas where the butterfly was in were, were, were largely separate but but connected by occasional movements, uh, so it's like a classic metapopulation. And to preserve the butterfly there, you needed to have a range of patches because a lot of those sort of separate areas were small, and, and naturally you'll get colon extinctions and recolonization. So you do need to uh, maintain a network of populations to conserve the butterfly. Sure. Need landscape scale conservation, sure. really. Tom, how do, you, how do you manage for this then? Is this just standard grazing? The, this is grazed, I think it looks like it's grazed by sheep, mm -hmm. which can uh, be a problem if they're grazing at this time of year because they can take all the nectar out, but it doesn't seem to be uh, spring grazed this site, so that's good. This means there's lots of nectar. So the, the management is, is a mixture of uh, grazing by uh, sheep or cattle, the cattle are a bit better because they poach the ground and create those bear patches yes. that are important. So grazing in the, uh, just winter grazing seems to be enough. And then some periodic scrub grazing, uh, sorry, periodic scrub clearance. We can see at this site the scrub is really starting to come through yeah. and it will need a, need a, a cutting at some point to, to, to knock it back. But that's also beneficial when you clear the scrub you get more bare ground again which which will uh, create habitat for the egg laying females tom had mentioned that brownfield sites could be good locations for habitat restorations for the grizzle skipper this resonated with something i'd heard before come over here we can see this creeping sankful, one of the main food plants, especially on brown field sites for the grizzle skipper. And if you look at egg laying opportunities rather than just amount of creeping sankful, there's a huge patch of creeping sankful there, but no egg laying opportunity. It's all amongst grass. None of that would ever be used by a grizzle skipper. None of that would ever be used by a grizzle skipper. So you can say the food plant's abundant, but the egg laying opportunities are nil. But suddenly, one, two, three leaves are ideal for egg laying by a grizzled skipper. And if I was searching for eggs, what you'd do normally with a pen is just turn the leaf over. And those are the only three leaves I'd ever check for an egg of grizzled skipper if I was searching for eggs. So you'd check none of those. And I have done this in the past and you find none, so just confirming that. But so just those three possibilities. And again, this is what explaining to farmers we try and do that because they're used to putting nutrients into soil whereas this is basically uh, little bits of chippings of rock with very minimal soil and it's been gone over with a JCB and compacted so it's absolutely ideal for wildflowers and in this case creating habitat for both the dingy and grizzle skipper. So you think that compacted soil is a good thing? Yes compacted soil is a good okay, thing. Okay and what about going around and bashing chunks out I mean I'm thinking I'm translating what you're saying to 
um, chalk grass them. So if, yeah. I, if I'm if I'm bashing chunks out, so looking at the turf. Yeah. So if you use a mattox, and basically what you're trying to do is it's always about mimicking nature. So in this case, if you use a mattox and you're taking chunks of soil out, and especially getting down to the subsoil or bare earth and bits of rock. It's really imitating cattle poaching because cattle in a wet season will create exactly the same things. Rabbit uh, scrapes will do exactly the same thing as well. It was clear that there were very real parallels between what Tom Brereton had learnt through his studies of the grizzle skipper and what Mike Slater had discovered as a consequence of his habitat restoration work. I then asked Mike if he could show me a brownfield site where he'd put this into practice. At the same time we put the uh, kidney vetch seed and birdsfoot truffle seed in, we also put several plugs and I think that looks like the original plug plant. And what it's done now is it's sent out runners of creeping sank foil and it's colonised this whole patch. So if you compare this with the place we've just come from and you look at egg laying opportunities rather than the abundance of the food plant, you'll see that the abundance of the food plant is probably exactly the same. But now if you start saying how many egg laying opportunities the grizzle skipper's got, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, you know, quite quickly, you've probably got about 50 egg laying opportunities here in this one small area, compared to the same density of food plants in the previous clip, where there was only three egg laying opportunities. The importance of bare ground in raising temperature for developing eggs and digesting caterpillars was clear but then Mike threw annual variations in climate into the mix. Well, I think they need something over about 40 degrees C. So again, this might be in its high 30s, which makes it marginal. So this is an area that might be used in a very warm spring, but would never be used in a cool spring uh, because it never warm up properly enough for it to use. So again, I think in warm springs, uh, the egg laying opportunities increase because uh, the ambient temperature of the bare ground, which will build up the temperature when the female is looking for somewhere to lay, there'll be more of those. And finally, in an ingenious attempt to further increase temperature at ground level, Mike has also experimented with adding a mulch of type 2 roadstone around the base of butterfly host plants, a practice that could be very beneficial if adopted more widely. Where do you see things going for the grizzle skipper? It's a bit worrying really for it. The butterfly to have its worst ever year last year. Uh, it is it is a species that's suffered from conservation management actually at some sites by too too uh, too, uh, too much of a uniform approach to management. Yeah. We've seen uh, today how, how what a varied structure it needs on sites, and quite often uh, conservation management has been, just been too general and targeted at uniformity for certain botanical communities so that's that that has been a problem uh, the other worry I suppose is climate change we don't know what effect that's having and uh, we, we don't understand why it hasn't benefited from climate change why it hasn't been able to spread spread north but uh, but on the positive side we've demonstrated uh, with some of our butterfly conservation projects that if we get the habitat right on site and uh, do that in a, a network at a landscape scale we can really turn around the fortunes of it. It's really interesting you say that because you might be aware of my own chalk grass and habitat restoration work at yeah. Dorothy Stringer School and around Brighton and Hove um, and we've been really successful at getting colonies of small blues uh, and we've been successful in at least getting Adonis to breed for a short period of time and, and chalk hills to come in but I've never seen a dingy or a grizzled skipper come to our sites. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in a way that, in part, uh, uh, relates to what you've seen uh, here and the other place you studied where you saw that they're quite a sedentary butterfly. But I've heard that said by so many butterfly yeah, ecologists and I'm not always sure right. that I believe it. I think in the, a lot of marking studies in the 1990s on the rarer species uh, suggested that butterflies are very sedentary. And that's true for the majority, but of course the, the 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 ones that you don't recapture, you've just no idea how far they go because most of those studies, like mine, were, were at a fairly small scale. So if something moves five, ten, twenty kilometres, you won't detect that through marking studies. So we did tend to underestimate how far things move, and studies of butterflies like the silver spotted skipper 
and the Adonis blue has shown that actually we can colonise. Yes, we can. Quite, you, you, quite, you can't ignore that, quite can you? Distant, quite some considerable distances, more, more than we previously thought. And I think also, in some senses, at the time of many, when many of these sort of mark recapture studies were taking place, butterfly populations, particularly in the 70s, were at the, a low ebb, weren't they? they were, and, and, and so the sort of density-dependent effects which might uh, lead to butterflies dispersing were not perhaps always happening in the sites where the people were studying them. And um, one of the things which I've realised through doing habitat restoration work, of course, is you're, you're doing it from the other end. You're seeing if it's coming to you. Yes, uh, 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 and I think that's, that, that's the best way round to do it, is create habitat in yeah. different distances and, and wait for the results. Yeah, 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 and, and, and it, well, it's just like having honeypots. It's a bit like the, uh, sugaring for moths, isn't it, really? Yeah. Um, and well, uh, I, th I think it... An important point is people have to be patient. Uh, we always want results in the first year of like a restoration project, and there's a temptation to put things back too oh, quickly. Yeah, I've seen lots of examples where people have wanted to reintroduce butterflies to to areas that they almost certainly will colonise. But if we if we let nature take its course, we can just learn so much more. Tom Brereton, Professor, Doctor, I don't know what to call you. It's been a great day. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Dan. It's been an absolute pleasure. It has been lovely, hasn't it? Has it's been brilliant. Thank you. If we're to halt the decline of the grizzled skipper, we need to apply the fine-scale management techniques that both Tom and Mike have described. This needs to take place on any existing sites where the butterfly is found and where habitat restoration is being undertaken. So to conclude, here's a fantastic example of a 12.5 hectare landscape scale conservation initiative that incorporates these approaches. So this site came up because of the NIA project, Nature Improvement Area project back in 2012. We were looking for sites along the South Downs Way corridor. This was close to a triple SI and had become overgrown. It should be really good chalk grassland. It's a local wildlife site and it's open access land. And we attracted millions of funding to create a corridor habitat from Winchester to Eastbourne using the South Downs Way as the corridor um, and following the Lawton principle of bigger, better, more connected. So it was connecting up pieces of chalk grassland that either we could expand or improve. So once you've got the money, you then have to go through landowner permissions. Um, are the landowners on board? Uh, it's obviously we're, we're coming onto their land, which is their business. They need to make money and they need to be able to farm that land as well as uh, Natural England um, with the triple SI up the top. There's only so much you can do on a triple SI, but luckily this was a local wildlife site, so it's not quite as tight restrictions. The main, the main clearance was done with a digger. So one guy in a big digger coming down the slope, literally ripping gorse and blackthorn out of the ground, which looked really destructive at the time. But now you've got disturbed habitat. You've got lots of bits of bare ground um, and at the time, because of the scarp slope, we wanted to keep that nutrient free. With burning, you end up with um, re-nutrient into the soil. So we got him to burn everything at the bottom of the slopes and keep the, the main slopes nutrient free. So about a year into the project, I started speaking to people from Butterfly Conservation about what we could do to improve the area for specific butterflies. Was there anything specific that they wanted us to do when we walked the site? Was that it would be a really good site for dingy skipper and grizzled skipper? So there was wild strawberry already here, so could we expand that out and create some clearings, some sheltered areas? So to make that work, we, we basically, instead of doing a, a linear strip, which we'd already done, we'd done the main connection, was now to create clearings off the main highway, as I'm going to call it, um, so that you've got little sheltered areas and where you've got strawberry, maybe scraping the ground out a little bit more. So if you've got excess vegetation, it can move in. There was always the intention to graze the area because obviously with mass scrub clearance, if you don't graze it, then your scrub's going to grow back. So we brought the cattle in and then um, having that little bit of bare ground where plants are just moving in is the ideal place for egg laying. The farmers were really supportive of all this. So when I first approached them, they told me that it was, it was fenced off back in the day with the war and ploughing and stuff and it was really unproductive. So it got fenced off and forgotten about and they never had the time or the money to do anything about it. And they've responded brilliantly. They've, they're so interested in the site now with all the butterflies. They, they send me pictures of butterflies and moths and plants and ask me what everything is. And it's absolutely fantastic to see. So with um, countryside stewardship, at the moment it's HLS, but we're moving into a new um, elms 
version. It's called ELMS because it's the Environmental Land Management Scheme and it's a new countryside stewardship programme for farmers to enter into to help them farm wildlife friendly. And we, we really need farmers to be on board with conservation work as well as getting their farm business to work. So having farmers like this that, that can make the business work for them so they get the grazing back and we gain the wildlife, but they also benefit from the wildlife too. After the filming at World Bottom had finished, we took a walk to see how the butterflies were faring. In an hour, we clocked up about 16 species, which I think is quite impressive after just four years' work on this 12.5 hectare site. And the grizzle skipper was one of those species that seemed to be doing particularly well. So it is possible to manage farmland to get butterfly species back. Now, it's clear that there are many examples of where the grizzle skipper has spread to new locations or where population sizes have increased because of sympathetic management changes to existing colonies. However, if I want to see this butterfly in any numbers, I need to get in my car and drive to some special, often protected site, and that just doesn't seem right to me. Over the last decade, many of us have had our focus on increasing the presence and population sizes of butterflies in urban environments. And now I'm beginning to believe that we should really be turning our attention to the new environmental land management scheme to change this focus towards the wider countryside. Butterflies are used as biodiversity indicators, so why should we not expect every farm to have populations of every butterfly species that they possibly potentially could host? We're going to be paying farmers to manage the land for the betterment of biodiversity. Why not set the bar high? Now, if you've enjoyed this film and are not a member of Butterfly Conservation, please consider doing so. Just go to their website, butterfly-conservation.org, and press the green Join tab on the top right-hand side of the website. Thank you. This one. Oh. <laughs>